All right, my uh, task is to talk a little bit about VTOS, venous thoracic outlet syndrome. We uh, briefly reviewed the anatomy just now, and uh, so the subclavian vein or axillary vein problem in TOS is an extrinsic compression in the costal clavicular space, and that's the space between the anterior scalene, the first rib, and the uh, costal clavicular ligament and the subclavius muscle. So it's more medial than the arterial component or the neurogenic component of TOS. And I like this one. I've tried and stay away in my practice, away from neurogenic compression. And I've been lucky because I've had colleagues along the way that are willing to do this neurogenic problem. Um, I find it very, very challenging, and so I've really stay away from it. But venous TOS is different. Venous TOS is very gratifying uh, when, you, when you help these patients. So the uh, presentation, unlike neurogenic TOS, the uh, venous TOS tends to happen more so in men than women. And there's really two age groups. Uh, it can happen in young children or adolescents. And um, in adolescents, like Carlos mentioned, it's really about 50-50 between neurogenic and uh, venous TOS. And it's typically in the dominant arm 70% of the time, and it's related to repetitive um, injury or strenuous activities. And about 75% of patients will report an acute event. So they will come up and show acutely as venous thrombosis or, or effort thrombosis. But about 25% or 30% of the patients may actually show up uh, chron with chronic symptoms in that they don't really have acute swelling, but they re report kind of chronic swelling and chronic um, discomfort of the arm towards the end of the day, and you will notice more collateral formation without that acute onset of severe arm swelling that happened in uh, most of them. So if you see the presence of collaterals, that sort of would suggest chronicity. The uh, diagnosis of the acute setup is really by ultrasound. Venous ultrasound will show that axillary subclavian vein thrombosis. Um, MRV is helpful in chronic cases where you're not really sure, you don't really see swelling when you examine the patient, but they do complain of, you know, some swelling towards the end of the day, swelling with um, activities. So MRV will show more collaterals and that sort of um, subclavian vein or axillary vein stenosis. But the, the diagnostic test really is selective contrast venogram when you're planning to intervene. So the for me, there's really two main goals of treating VTOS, and that is to eliminate symptoms of swelling, and the other one is to prevent recurrence of symptoms with um, thoracic outlet decompression and, and prevent long-term disability. So the current standard of care, although there's still a lot of controversies about you know, when to do it and the timing of it and the surgical approach to it, but the the, the Important points, I think, to remember is that most patients will benefit with, um, from catheter-directed thrombolysis, a combination of uh, lysis and mechanical thrombectomy for the acute DVT, and then they should all have uh, thoracic outlet decompression with first rib resection, um, plus or minus scaling muscle resection, as well as subclavus muscle um, sort of resection. And, um, really correction of the vein stenosis after they've had decompression. And most people would keep these patients on a period of anticoagulation post-intervention. So catheter-directed thrombolysis and a mechanical thrombectomy for the acute effort thrombosis is very um, highly successful if we catch these patients within two weeks of onset of symptoms. And it's usually a combination of both mechanical thrombectomy and catheter-directed thrombolysis that will lead to complete recanalization of the thrombose, subclavian, and axillary vein in these patients. And after the, you've recanalized the vein, then if there's still an, sort of intrinsic stenosis of the vein, then there is a role for balloon angioplasty. But uh, definitely, we should not stent until after thoracic outlet decompression with first rib resection. The timing of the rib resection is a little controversial. I think um, if you read the literature now, most of the textbook would tell you, you know, to right after the lysis, do it in the same setting, do it in the same admission. Um, I, in my own practice, have not had the urgency to do the rib resection while the patient's arm is still swollen. So although, you know, after the acute thrombosis, you lyse them, um, the swelling will come down quite remarkably over the next few days. 
um, I have tended to wait a little bit longer before I bring them back for first root resection. But you should do it soon rather than, um, rather than wait too long. So um, the, there are really three surgical approaches to removing the first rib. And the uh, supraclavicular or the paraclavicular is really for the neurogenic and arterial TOSD compression. Um, and I'm going to leave that up to Dr. Zizade to talk to you a little bit more about in the next session. For venous thoracic outlet sort of um, decompression, what I have favor is um, the infraclavicular um, or the supraclavicular um, resection. Although I think the transaxillary rib resection, first rib resection is probably the best one for women um, because it is under the armpit. This is not something that I was trained in, and it's something if you get a chance to train with people, um, you gotta you gotta be there to see it. This is a very small um, exposure, and usually as a fellow, we tend to be the retractors rather than the guys decompressing. So it was hard. At, you know, the few cases that I was scrubbing as a fellow, you know, I couldn't really see anything. So it was hard for me, you know, out in practice to really start doing this on my own. But, uh, but I, think it is, I think it does work, and I'll show you the data in the next slide, um, in decompressing the, uh, the area very well, but you really do need to know how to uh, expose um, the area. So essentially what it is, is um, this is the view that you'll get. Uh, diagrammatically, you have the vein, the uh, scaling anterior um, artery, and the brachial plexus more laterally. So A, B, C, you then cut the scaling muscle and then cut the first rib and um, decompress the nerve a little bit um, and it um, usually give us a piece of first rib that looks something like this. So the contemporary results of first rib resection for venous thoracic outlet syndrome um, are very good and in this table we can see that um, you know the patency after thrombolysis, thrombectomy, and then first rib resection is a very good um, long term. This is like 94% throughout to 100% in this uh, particular series. Dr. Urschel is probably the one with the largest series. And um, you see the various approaches um, here, inter, uh, infraclavicular, supraclavicular here, and then transaxillary here. So all three approaches really give us effective decompression of the thoracic outlet. Um, and you just have to pick your own um, and go with it. Let me show you the, one of the cases that I was involved with. This is a few years ago, a 28-year-old female medical student who um, came in with acute onset of right arm swelling. And she had the typical history, but she waited a couple of weeks before she came in. But the ultrasound did show that she had right axillary vein thrombosis. And so um, the management is then to um, first start her on systemic anticoagulation, we admitted her, and then we took her to the angiographic suite to do a mechanical thrombectomy and um, leave a catheter for a directed thrombolysis for the residual clots that didn't go away with the mechanical thrombectomy. And then uh, I put her back on anticoagulation for um, I think a couple of weeks and then I brought her back for a first rib resection. So let me show the, the images, this is her images. Uh, when we went in, and uh, you can see that everything is thrombosed um, centrally, and you had a lot of thrombosis of the uh, smaller uh, collateral veins as well. So she had some chronicity um, as well. So um, I did um, mechanical thrombectomy, and there's several different devices that you can use. Um, the one I typically use is the Androjet, and after Androjet mechanical thrombectomy, um, I still have as a residual thrombus, so I left a catheter inside and then provided her with catheter-directed thrombolysis over um, 24 hours and brought her back. And this is her picture after we've lysed her, and you can sort of see there's still a, a residual sort of intrinsic stenosis likely caused by the sort of chronic extrinsic compression. So I went ahead and ballooned that, and um, this is sort of the balloon angioplasty um, after the lysis. It, look, it doesn't look perfect, um, but she's reopened. And um, this is the, the final result after the balloon angioplasty. So we sent her home and then brought her back and did the first re resection. Um, and uh, this is the venogram that uh, we uh, 
obtained after the first wave recession. And I kept on Coumadin for six months. Six months may be overcall. I think maybe people are now moving towards three months of anticoagulation rather than six months. Um, this is several years back. The one thing that you should not do is do not put a stent before you decompress the first rib. That's sort of, a, I think, the take home message from my talk. And this is what happens if you put a stent without decompressing the area, is that you will have stent fracture. And even without true thoracic outlet syndrome, um, if you put a stent in subclavian vein, this happens even in the patients without the uh, um, thoracic obstructions, such as you know, the dialysis patient, I'm sure. Um, you will get to see if, um, if uh, patients have stents in the subclavian vein, this can happen not infrequently. And this is what leads to recurrent stenosis or recurrent occlusion um, and failure. So you, is there any role for stenting? I think for the venous thoracic outlet syndrome, once you've decompressed the first rib, and if you repeat the venogram after you've decompressed, removed the rib, and you still see an intrinsic stenosis that you're not happy <coughs> with, then I think there's a potential role for stenting in that scenario, although it is somewhat controversial. Um, I would say in my practice, I currently don't really do any more thoracic outlet um, problems, but I do see a lot of people with chemo or radiation injury to the subclavian and axillary vein, and this is an example I'd like to show you is, um, so this is not your typical you know, thoracic outlet syndrome, but it does happen you know, when they get heavy dose of radiation over the, uh, the lung, they get this chronic sort of fibrosis of the subclavian vein. And so this is a case of a 63-year-old man who was treated with chemoradiation for a stage 3B lung cancer uh, three years ago, and he's free of cancer currently. And he comes in with one to two-week history of right arm swelling and neck and face um, swelling. And the ultrasound was actually negative for any acute DVT. And so you may wonder, well, you know, um, maybe he does have thoracic outlet syndrome, you know. But I can tell you, you ain't going to operate on this person with radiation and skin changes, and, and so <laughs> stay away from those patients, okay? Do not do thoracic outlet um, decompression because um, the, the healing after that would be tremendous. But this is what, uh, what I did, um, and so we, uh, we uh, did a venogram, and this is this first venogram and really don't see any sort of acute thrombosis. Don't really see any filling defects, don't see any real true clot on the venogram. So I went ahead and ballooned this area, and so this is the area that he got most of the heavy radiation. And so I ballooned it, and it looked, meh, maybe a little bit better afterwards. Um, I don't have the afterward picture, huh? Hang on a sec. Do I have an afterward picture? Um, I don't really have an afterward picture. It looked a little bit better, but he said his pain was better, his swelling was better, so he went home. And he came back two months later with a sort of a recurrent acute thrombosis. And I took him back, and this is what happens after two months after the balloon angioplasty. So things look worse there with more thrombus. So then we lysed him. We did mechanical thrombectomy, lysed him, and balloon him. But the balloon showed that it really didn't open up. So this time I decided to put a stent in. Um, and I picked a uh, self-expandable stent. Um, that's actually a cover stent, because I believe those cover stent do not fracture as much as the uncover stent. So I left a vibe on 9 by 10, and this is sort of the post uh, venogram, post uh, stenting picture. And six months follow-up is good so far. He hasn't had any recurrent uh, symptoms, and he's very happy. So the controversies about venous uh, TOS is really about the timing of decompression, you know, do we do it right after we lyse them or do we wait a little bit, is that safe? Um, and then the secondary use of stenting, you know, should we stent people that don't have perfect result after we've done um, the first rib resection? The best surgical approach, I think all three seems comparable to me, reviewing the literature, you're just gonna have to pick whatever you're most comfortable with yourself in your own practice. And then, in summary, um, I think early diagnosis is, is key because um, catheter directed thrombolysis and uh, first root resection is very effective in treating these people with venous TOS. The uh, primary use, again, of venous stenting is really contraindicated until after venous decompression. And I will end it there. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Wayne.